Good morning, everybody. Stu Smith here going live. Hope you're doing well. Happy Halloween. End of the month. How are you closing out your October? Getting ready for November? Getting into the colder months of the year? Are you still outside getting it done? Or are you moving inside? Getting most of your workouts done inside? It's up to you how that works. I personally have... Uh, been enjoying the outdoor uh, winter months with uh, workouts because I will tell you this when you're cold outside you don't want to stop moving so there's not a whole lot of resting going on when you're uh, when it's chilly outside so it's something that we picked up after COVID when all the gyms were closed we said screw it we don't have uh, we don't have a gym that can ha you know work with as many people as we have going on right now so let's just do it outside and then the second year we were like you know we could go inside right now but last year was pretty fun you know i think we got harder definitely got uh some good workouts in um it's just different you know it's something it was a new challenge and i think if you're gonna truly acclimate to weather and get good at hot and humid get good at cold and freezing and everything in between rainy snowy doesn't matter you're going to be working in that kind of environment one day if you're going down this journey of a tactical athlete in whatever profession that is uh, you might as well get used to doing it so that's what we do it's uh, kind of a new uh, phenomenon for us, but we are, uh, I think it's going to be a an everlasting thing. Though we may uh, hit a few days indoors, depending on just how cold it is. I don't think I want to do it in single digits. Like cold as it gets here is like high teens with a wind chill. You know, if it's in the 20s, that's yeah, not too bad. Got some heaters out there. We get it done. So, what am I talking about today? Um, today's title of this one is called Give Yourself a Break Before You Break Yourself. Now, there's many ways you can do this. A lot of it has to do with the mastery of recovery. So, if you read some articles, in fact, I'll post a few of them here that are pretty good. If you read some articles called the uh, uh, the Longevity is the mastery of recovery, but you know what else is? If you guys have been listening to me for a while, you will know what the answer is. The mastery of recovery is also, in fact, if I type it in here, is also optimal performance is the mastery of recovery. So depending on, I, or I should say, regardless of your age, and your goals if you want to be hardcore when you're young and hitting it multiple workouts a day you still have to master recovery before you see any benefits um same with getting older or should i say if you're training smart now you can actually do this for many years even when you're older versus being broken and unable to do anything so once again, the mastery of recovery leads to longevity as well. So check out those articles if you're curious what I'm talking about. Gives you some good uh, insight there. And I did a great podcast with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Berenger, who's a nutritionist, PhD. And, um, you know, obviously nutrition is a very key function of that process of recovery just as much as sleep, if not more. Though some people will say sleep is more important. Some people say nutrition is more important. I put them right there at like 50-40. So I'd say 50% is sleep, 40% is nutrition, and then everybody spends all their time and money on that missing 10% for some reason, right? If you master sleep and nutrition, you will handle a majority of recovery. Then you can, you know, if you're really 
focusing on recovery of to another level, then you can add in those extra things. But those extra things don't matter if you're not sleeping and eating well. So there you go. Um, normally, um, in fact, that, that's the title of my article, by the way. Give yourself a break before you break yourself. And I go on three levels. So there's a break from technology, which you just got to break away during the day. It's killing us. You know, eight, ten hours a day, people are looking at some form of screen. I know this is part of that. But, you, you know, you can limit it and actually be somewhat useful um, to your recovery by just getting away from the screen, going for a walk, taking some deep breathing. That's another form of recovery, you know, relaxing the mental and emotional stress that occurs, you know, go for a walk, do some box breathing. You know, that's a great source of recovery. That's what I, I try to do every day. And then every park bench that I walk past, which in my normal walk path, I've probably hit about eight park benches. I stop and do some stretches, put my feet on them, do some, you know, pigeon poses, dog pose, whatever, up, down, dog, stretch it out, stretch out the hammies, thighs, all that stuff. And it's lower back. It's good stuff. And um, all while I'm breathing deeply. So that's a good way to recover. And then the other one was uh, give yourself a break. Let me see. I have three categories that I'm using. I'm trying to find that article. I already started writing it last night. Because I was inspired. Not sure how, but I was just inspired. So break, put on the brakes physically. That means yes. Give yourself a day off. Do some mobility work. Um, take a break from alcohol, food, you know, processed food, sugar. Those are killing us too. Um, massage, massage tool, good posture, you know, all of those things can physically give yourself a break, you know, put on the brakes, breathe, emotional, mental relaxation. Uh, and then the other one is technology. So I go, I break it down into three parts, physical, mental, and technology. Give yourself a break from all of those things. And probably have a, a list of 15 things that we all need to seriously consider taking a break from because it's you know this world's not getting easier even with all this fancy technology that's supposed to be making it easier for us all right so um that's that and then let, let me go into uh just what we're doing here um this week. So this week's a fun one. One of my favorite pyramid workouts is you warm up with all the calisthenics. So just like all the other pull up, push up, sit up, dip pyramids, run 400 every set. So you get 10 400s out of this. You get 55 pull ups, 110 push ups, 165 sit ups, and 55 dips on the way up. So that's kind of a warm up you know, for our drill. Let me go run a mile, shake it out. So you've already done 10 400s and a mile. So that's what, three and a half. Then you do the lift. So we warm up with that and then we lift. And our lifts are bench press, weight vest, pull-ups or pull-downs, moderately heavy, and then each set gets heavier. So you actually come down the back side of the pyramid. Um, uh, bicep overhead presses and machine or dumbbell rows. Uh, so there's four exercises that you come down, but you come down on even sets and you don't run during these. So you do 10 of bench press, pull-ups, bicep overhead, rows. Then you do eight of those four exercises. Then you do six of those four exercises and four, then two, boom, 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 all the way down. You get heavier every set. And then after that, go for a run or a swim, depending on what you need to work on the most. We usually top it off with a 50-50 swim workout. So we did that this morning, but I'll swim at noon. So I, I couldn't get the swim in today. Uh, tomorrow will not be a hill day. We normally run hills, but 
as we transition out of the high mileage of the spring and summer, we uh, are still doing some 800s, probably get one, two, three, yeah, about three miles in versus six with the hill. And we're getting some squats and kettlebell swings and deadlifts and, you know, some core work, 400 meter lunges. That's a good one to build up to if you uh, do that. Um, yeah. And then we'll swim a fence or ruck, depending on what you need to work on. Some guys do both. Then Wednesday's a mobility day. Excellent day. One of my favorites. Work on some hip, knee, ankle, uh, lower back, shoulder mobility work, uh, some flexibility drills, and then we'll go into the pool and pr actually practice all the treading and drown proofing and swimming, you know, just working on technique stuff uh, that requires you to have some form of mobility to actually do it well, especially treading. A lot of people miss out on, you know, 50% of their kick because they just can't get into a proper treading position whether that's a scissor kick or it's a egg beater kick especially egg beater that's a tough one for a lot of people then uh thursday we have uh upper body day again um all weight vest stuff this is a tough one weight vest pull-ups weight vest push-ups we do a warm-up without weight vest run a mile and a half time to see where we are then we uh do all weight vest pull-ups and push-ups with some Four, uh, 800 meter sets in there uh, no weight vest and then we swim time of 500 just see where we are and then do this is one of my favorites we do swim 300 meters five sets of 300 meters and your goal if you're trying to get a yard per second on your swim your goal is to um do 300 yards in 300 seconds. That's five minutes. So now you have this five-minute swim goal. Every time you swim five minutes, try to be at 300 yards um, because that will get you 500 yards in 500 seconds. Next thing you know, you're swimming an 820. You know, you beef it up a little bit for a couple of sets uh, of those uh, laps, and you got an eight flat, which is way above average. Um and it's a good PST score, especially if you're trying to be your your PSTs are getting more competitive, especially in the officer ranks requires you to score a little bit higher. Then um, let's see. Day five. I'm going to have to leave my guys to themselves because they are uh, doing a leg day at the track. But I have a special workout I'm doing with the. ROTC groups at University of Maryland. So they've asked me to come in there and run them through some workouts. And that's my plan this Friday, which should be fun. Um, and then uh, Saturday is just a big cardio and core day, which is a lot of fun. Just lots of abs, planking, uh, you know, all the grinder PT type abs that you would do, flutter kicks, leg levers, atomic sit-ups, things like that. Um, mixed with running for 30 minutes, rucking for 30 minutes, and then swimming for 30 minutes. So it's a fun one. So that's what we're doing this week. So as you can see, it's a mix of kind of, we're in a stage of warming up with calisthenics and hitting some weights or weight vest type movements. And then we're cooling down with some cardio with some interval stuff thrown in there too on some days. So that's kind of where we are on our fall training um, transition into the winter lift cycle. Not where I wouldn't consider us in a heavy lift cycle yet. We're still practicing some technique stuff, probably not even getting higher than our body weight very much. Every now and then with deadlifts and squats, we'll go a little bit more in our body weight, but not too much right now. And then eventually we'll, get to lift him pretty heavy, probably build up to about two times body weight on deadlifts and squats, things like that. All right. Let's see. So first comment, uh, Zythin, I guess. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. 
this stream started. I just began a week off after uh, completing competitive scores of PFT. Was feeling guilty. Was not about not working out. Yeah, I'll have that article. In fact, I will post that article tomorrow on tomorrow's CSS critique live Q and A that we do tomorrow at nine o'clock. Uh, but it'd be up on military.com. I'm not finished with it yet. But um, yeah, you need some days off. You know, one thing I would do though, if you're not working out purposefully, even if you're ill or you know not crazy ill, but even if you're injured or or sick, like head cold type stuff, I would suggest mobility uh, training this week, and you I call it my mobility 30, um, just 30 minutes a day. If you want to add, make it for an hour, that's up to you. But check out this article and it just give you some ideas on what to do if you're taking some time off after, you know, a hard cycle. Like there's a lot of programs out there that will sometimes like crush like pretty hard progressions for four eight, 12 weeks, and then, you know, there'll be a deload week. And sometimes that deload week can be some time off. It can be decreased intensity, decreased mileage, decreased reps, you know, all of those things just to make a little bit easier on yourself. I have found that complete time off where you do nothing has not been beneficial for me personally. I've always felt like I needed to do something in this mobility day is personally a really good something to do i would also maybe work on some technique issues when you're not training hard uh technique in swimming technique in treading technique drown proofing you know those type of events are really good things to add into a deload week and one thing we do in the winter which i don't think i have my winter lift cycle maybe i do I don't think I have any more of those books. I have one of the spring. But anyway, it's a three-to-one block periodization model where we will do three weeks of lifting with one week deload, but that deload is all calisthenics and cardio. So what happens there is we push pretty hard with the lift cycle, then we shut it down, no weights, and it's all calisthenics and cardio. So that's our deload week. And what I found over the last couple of years of doing this is that, yes, it was perfect timing for not lifting. Everybody's starting to feel like feeling the aches and pains of that lift cycle. Um, nothing crazy, but we shut it down and then we hit some cows and cardio. And that was perfectly timed for people to see some results from upper body strength that maybe they had created. They pick up a few push-ups, pick up a few pull-ups, um, but they're also maintaining and even improving their timed runs, their timed swims. Um, we're not running a lot of mileage during the winter lift cycle. Um, probably cut it to about 50% of what we do, maybe even more of what we do in the summer, but it's all fast. So it's perfect for if you're trying to maintain your PST and IFT scores, things like that, and you want to lift, that three-to-one block periodization works really well. And it doesn't have to be my program. Just do three weeks of lifting, do a week of calisthenics and cardio, right? I have, like I said, I have a way to train, not the only way to train, but that three-to-one block periodization has been instrumental in many guys improving PST scores, improving strength numbers, and putting on about 10 pounds of mass over the the winter lift cycle and it's lean you know they're not getting fat because we are doing some cardio so check out that in fact i'll put uh it's called block periodization we did one in the spring as well um but i'm just going to share the uh um winter block periodization model and some of our lessons learned that we uh did originally we started off as a four and two weeks so four weeks of lifting two weeks of cows and cardio and we found out that four weeks was probably too long without a deload cycle 
and two weeks was too much of cows and cardio in that cycle. So I actually had a, a physiologist, um, exercise physiologist, give me that advice to say, especially since your goal is to lift more in a 12 or 16 week cycle, try the the three to one model because in a 12 week cycle, you're going to lift for nine weeks, recover cows and cardio for three weeks. Or if you did it the other way, it's eight weeks and four weeks of lifting. So you get an extra week every 12 weeks. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, let's see. Oh, let's see. Any thoughts on training night sleep? hour in regards to training i'm not sure what you're asking there night training at night and sleep go on alex you gotta learn to type right now i am at five to six hours a night because i can't fit everything in a 24 hour day i just don't know where i'm at um Five to six isn't horrible. Um, it's not great. And if you're young, you could probably get away with it for a while. I will say this, though. It will creep up on you, especially if you're banging it out hard week after week after week with no real, like, deload week. Those deload weeks will come in handy, especially when you are sleeping less. You're going to need one. Because that's the only way you're really going to be recovering. Your best recovery is sleep. So seven, eight hours, absolutely. I don't personally like to train at night unless it's easy and technique driven. Because I try to go to sleep fairly early, like 9, 30, 10, get up at 5. And if I work out at like 7, 30, 8, like cranking out you know, heavy reps in the gym or like fast runs and sprints and, you know, high rep calisthenics. I won't go to sleep till midnight because I am jacked. Like it's just, you know, that's kind of like I love to work out first thing in the morning because I am probably at my most productive in my day between, you know, when I get back at 8 a.m. between probably 8 and 1 p.m. So. 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. And then after that, I need to eat something, you know, kind of slow down a little bit, do some other things that aren't quite as demanding. And then I usually catch a second wind after a you know, swim workout or maybe you go for a 30 minute run um, and then come back, you know, hit a couple more hours at work, things like that. So, yeah, I. That's my advice. I If you're trying to get to sleep, I wouldn't do it right before you sleep. If anything, wake up a little earlier, get a good night's sleep, and um, try to fit it in somehow. But you may be doing too much. I mean, I've, I mean, it's very rare that I don't get enough in. Now, if you're also juggling school and work and sports, you know, it's hard to get everything in. You got to be really creative about about it. In fact, when probably my most tight schedule was probably when I was a student at the Naval Academy where I had to get first part of my workout done before school started, which was somewhere between 5.30 to 7. And then, you know, eat breakfast, school starts at 8. You know, you're in class all morning. Uh, you might have some time at lunch to get a quick 20, 30-minute swim in. Um then I go to rugby practice, you know, I have afternoon classes. Then I go to rugby practice for a couple hours. And then after rugby practice, we run to and from rugby practice, which is a couple miles. And then we would stop off at the pool, swim a little bit, and then go study till about midnight and do it all over again. So I was hitting about five hours of sleep as well. So it's it's possible to get a whole lot done. But it uh, it's hard. You got to really, you know, recovery is you got to master your recovery. So everything else, if you're cranking out hours like this, your food has to be good. 
you know, if you're not sleeping a lot of hours, your sleep has to be good. Um, and then be smart with your training. Don't do the same muscle groups day after day after day. You know, you should have a smart split routine so you can actually recover from day to day to day when you're burning the candle at both ends. Because you're going to do that, too, when you're in your, you know, tactical, you know, unit. You know, military, law enforcement, police officers, those guys. I mean, you just, you're working nights. You're working days. Crazy shifts just depends on the job. You know, so you miss out on some sleep and you're sleeping weird hours too. All right, TR, yeah, Tactical Fitness Report 50. Stay fit during the fall and winter. Tips and ideas is a must watch this time of year. Oh, cool. Glad you like that one. Yeah, it's just, you know, I think I've created that tactical fitness report report before I created my block periodization model. So I, that has even evolved a little bit. So I probably need to do an update on that one. Um, I mean, not that that one's outdated. It's just. You know, it's something that still works. I just have think I've found something that works better for me. And, um, you know, especially when you're trying to deal with all the elements of fitness that, you know, the tactical world requires. Because if you're a tactical athlete, you got what do you got to be good at? Power, strength, speed, agility, muscle stamina, endurance, run, ruck, swim. Um, Flexibility, mobility, grip, uh, and all those things need to be organized in a balanced way because it's really hard to get good at all of them at the same time. You know, you may have to put some on the back burner, maintain them while you master, you know, some of the ones that you're not good at, you know, your weaknesses. Because why? Because your weaknesses will be exposed very quickly. When you go through any type of tactical fitness training. All right. From Joe. Happy Halloween. What do you think makes for a great SOAS application for those applying to OCS? What is typically your advice for civilians pursuing it? Yeah. For the uh, SOAS OCS guys. Um, you know what? It is a diverse group. I have seen guys that are, you know, fresh out of college that have no work experience that are just boom 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 it's the next progression let's go join the military um i've seen guys you know they have now they've had a college degree they've you know maybe a tough one and that, that varies too you could have mechanical engineers you can have english and history majors but you need good grades it's very competitive um especially if you have no work history on the back side of that you know, they're going to really scrutinize your academic performance. Um, you know, your athletic performance. You know, a lot of these are D1 athletes. Some of them aren't. You don't have to be. Some of them are presidents of their class or presidents of their fraternity even. You know, it. it I've seen all types um, get those OCS slots. And... Um, yeah, I've seen older guys too, 28, 29 year old guys that are made their money in finance world and teachers and police officers, you know, all, firemen, you know, ver wide variety of, you know, professions that are looking to join the military and go to OCS and do the SOAS, which SOAS stands for SEAL Officer Assessment and Selection, if you're not familiar with it. And the cool thing about that is you go over the summer about three or four blocks during the summer where you're going to be competing for these buds slots as an officer, which are fairly limited. I mean, they only take like 65 to 75 every year. Um, I think this year it's somewhere in between that, maybe 69, 70. Um, and you know, so it's competitive, especially when you have hundreds of people applying for these jobs and these opportunities to go to BUDS even. Um, so they'll send probably 
200 of them to SOAS to pick 60 of them. Now, luckily for the board, SOAS itself is very difficult. So people fail fitness tests, they fail events, they fail, um, or they, I shouldn't say they fail, they, uh, they quit, um, they get injured, they get rolled out of the program and they're, they're done because it's not like a rollback thing. You're only there for two weeks. Um, so, you know, it, it's really competitive. And I think that number gets whittled down from 200 to about 90 to 100. So you lose about half of them, if not more. And so now they have a board where the next week where they do interviews and all that for those 90 to 100 applicants who made it through the hard part of the selection. Now they got to go through the interviews and other things like that. And that is a, uh, that's a good process as well. Very challenging. You know, the, how you, you know, handle yourself with a bunch of people asking you questions and how you speak and, you know, what do you know? Are you saying stupid stuff? You know, all those things get part of the big picture. And um, though the physical is very important, that is very important as well. And then, you know, by this time every year, usually the OCS guys find out, probably should be any day now. Um, Academy guys find out, the uh, ROTC guys find out this month, or maybe they've already have. And then, um, you know, they go to buds the following year. So that number is going to be from anywhere from 90 to 100, whittled down to about 70, let's say. And so there'll be some people who are disappointed that they didn't get the slot, but they can try again next year, especially for the OCS guys. So I've seen a few guys put in two in a row and get it the second time. But they had to come back stronger, they had to come back faster, come back better, because uh, they're expecting a lot more out of you if you've already experienced it before. Um, so, plus it's good. You know, if you have per the persistence to try again, they like that. But persistence with improved performance after failure speaks volumes about your abilities and your character because they want to see people succeed after failing, right? And not just give up. That's that's very important, you know, one of those intangibles that um, if you can do that, it, like I said, it speaks volumes of who you are. Um, but yeah, it doesn't really matter, to be honest with you. Just have killer PT scores. That's, that's your foot in the door. Have some good letters of recommendation. Um, have good grades. Uh, maybe some work uh, history. You know, if, I personally, you know, like a lot of people try to get SEALs to write letters of recommendation for them. I personally would rather have your boss write a letter of recommendation for you, a teacher, a coach, you know, somebody who knows you versus somebody who spends 10 minutes with you and says, yeah, he passed an interview. He's a pretty solid guy. I like him. He's a nice guy. Let's, uh, you know. So, we, we, you know, so what will happen is, we, you know, we know a lot of these guys and I was on the board before we'd call them up. So how do you know this guy? All right. And, oh, I've known him since he was like six years old. That's a different story. You know, you know, when you have somebody like that, who's maybe a family friend or um, somebody that's known you for that long versus somebody who said, yeah, we had a 20 minute interview. Good kid. I liked him. You know, those those tend to not mean a lot. Now, if it's from like a two star admiral, might mean a little more. People tend to listen to those guys a little more, I guess. It, it might be a little heavier or weighted, but I'd still rather have a, a coach or a teacher versus someone who doesn't know you. So consider that for making your application. So sorry for the long answer, but. A lot of people don't understand the process of becoming an officer and going to BUDS. I've written a couple articles about it. You can definitely find them. All right. Uh, Stu, I've been swimming consistently with fins for about two years now, but my feet always hurt by the end, right in the middle of my arch, different size fins available. Yeah, I, I would consider that. If you're 
getting your feet jammed up in there, you're going to have some cramping in your arches. Um, ankles should, you know, if you've been swimming for two years now, hopefully your ankles are not hurting you. Um, yeah, I would definitely see if you can find another, maybe if you have rocket fins, maybe try the jet fins. Uh, maybe get a different pair of booties that maybe have an arch support in them. So you need a bigger footwell. So, for instance, I I had a pair of booties that were basically like shoes on the bottom versus just a, you know, neoprene dive sock with a thin rubber bottom. Mine were actually, I could run on concrete in them because they were had like a, like a three-quarter inch sole. Um, but because of that, I needed, um, so I was probably like an, a super size, uh, or extra large. So I needed a super extra large or extra, extra large boot in order for my foot to fit in there. So my suggestion, if you can find a scuba shop, try on a few pairs of fins, see how they feel, um, and see if maybe you get a, a better pair of booties too. Because um, eventually the pain of swimming with fins should go away in about a month versus always hurting you. If it's always hurting you, you got some sizing issues you got to deal with. And that's going to be a lot of, you know, hit and miss trying to figure out which is going to work for you. Let's see, going to be easing back in the week's lead on. I'll check out the mobility exercises. Yep, that's a good one to do. Don't take too much time off. Just because you had a PST with great scores doesn't necessarily mean you need a month off. Right? Just deload a week and get back to it. Um, hey, Stu, I'm noticing my right hip flexor is weaker than my left. No pain, just burns out faster. Then the other one during lunges, treading, running, any tips on balancing them out? Huh, good question. I would say probably, you know, do more hip flexor work. Hanging knee ups is a good one. Um, and the more you do bilateral stuff, it's going to equal out eventually. One won't be increasing while the other one is increasing to kind of catch up. Uh, if you wanted to add some weight, maybe some ankle weights to those hanging knee ups, might not be a bad idea. You can do some individual uh, hip flexor stuff if you'd like, but I always like to do them bilaterally because the hips are just so important that, you know, yeah, you can do some isolation on one side if you prefer, especially if you're injured. A weakness could could be helpful, but it just flutter kicks. You know, maybe try some flutter kicks with maybe your your right one having an ankle weight on it and your left one not having an ankle weight on it. Just test it out, see how that feels, uh, and then take it off and then keep doing bilateral stuff with the same uh, weight on it or no weight and, you know, continue with that. But I wouldn't do it every day either. You know, I would treat it, you know, treat it like a leg day you know, where you are, you know, two, three times a week, um, working it out like that. Now you can do some, if you, uh, do a Google search or YouTube search on hip flexor exercises, you might get some ideas that you can do even just laying down, like while you're watching TV. And what I would try is try this, try laying down and lifting your right leg up like if you're laying on the couch, your left leg's relaxed, your right leg is six inches off the ground or off the couch, and your leg's straight, and you just have a nice flexed thigh, and you feel that hip flexor starting to burn. Hold that for like 20 seconds. Do that 10 sets. Um, you know, and then, you know, change the angle, you know, throughout the time you're you're doing it so six inches 12 inches 18 inches you're almost vertical holding it up there and just give it that 20 second th um maybe go 20 seconds and then give it a minute break 
you know, those are little ways where you can isolate it and work on some of the maybe strengthening endurance issues that you may be having. Because it could be a combination of strength where it needs to be fixed or, uh, you know, weakness, or it's a muscle stamina issue where it just needs, you know, better endurance. So I would play around with both of those, you know, especially if it's lunges and treading and running that's bothering you with it versus, you know, something you know, anything with high reps is you're probably dealing with a muscle stamina issue versus a strength issue. But it won't hurt to do some strength and some timed events just to work on some stamina, too. All right. Let's see here. Uh, just enlisted into DEP Air Force. Got the IFT. Cool. November 15th. I'm confident of all the exercises, but swimming, do you have any advice? Oh, man, I have tons of advice. The good news is you can use freestyle if you don't know how to do the CSS in that IFT. Um, my recommendation, because the IFT has swimming last, is arrange your workout so you swim last. So you do your pull-up, push-up, sit-ups, you go for a run, and you swim last. Um, that's going to be key. And then it's technique. You know, it's two things. It's technique and conditioning. So once you've mastered the technique, you're going to really have to learn how to get in swimming shape. In fact, there's a great workout. Um, I have a 50-50 workout that I use for uh, the Navy guys that are preparing for the... Um, PST, which is a combat swimmer stroke uh, swim, but I also have one for an Air Force that is a mix of underwaters. It's a mix of freestyle, and it's just, it's really hard. So check out this article, and you will see a really good swim workout that you can do. And if you want to do the Navy one, too, that works out as well if you're considering doing the CSS. But the freestyle tends to get you in better swimming shape faster. And the CSS is what you really want to focus your technique training on if you're going to test with the CSS. If you're going to test with freestyle, my suggestion would be get a coach that teaches freestyle because every swimming pool has somebody that's going to teach you freestyle. Not everybody knows the CSS. They may know the elementary side stroke, which is an old lifeguard stroke. You know, grab an apple, put it in the basket. You know, not very effective, um, typically for fast 500s. Though I will say that's what we used uh, as a side stroke uh, back in the 80s. And then the CSS evolved in the 90s to where it is now. Okay, Joe's going back to SOAS. I've heard rumors that the pre-SOAS screener has changed. Is there any truth to that? How do you have your academy guys prep for that in particular? Um, I have not heard anything about the pre SOAS screener changing. Um, now, they may add in other PST exercises, but as of right now, I have not heard that is the case. I will hear that is the case very soon because I'm probably helping 50 guys prepare for it. Um, so um, if I do put it this way, Joe, if I hear that it is changing, I will have a live Q&A on it. I'll have an article on it. I'll probably do a podcast on it. I will get the word out, you know, quickly. In fact, I'll title it Changed PST for SOAS. You know, so uh, I would, you know, just Google that and uh, it'll be an article or a you know, podcast or one of these live Q and A's. But as of right now, I have not heard any of that. We right now we're just preparing for the PST. Now we have a screener at the Naval Academy that is 36 hours long that whittles down probably 150 to 200 midshipmen that want to go to BUDS that 
their junior year have to go through this 36 hour long screening weekend maybe that is something they are going to introduce to OCS and ROTC guys as well so it may be an actual weekend of activities and testing which is all over the place from you know you, you weighted pull ups bench press deadlifts log pt obstacle courses i mean there'll be a ton of testing things for that pre screener most of it's just a beat down getting cold wet sandy bear crawling all the time cuz i think they want to make the screener a little bit harder because they lost so many um OCS and ROTC guys during that uh last year's last few years of uh SOAS. So they're just not exposed to that level of training until they get to SOAS, whereas the Academy midshipmen, you know, get that weekend screener to like thin the herd a little bit before they even go to SOAS. So they and we have SEALs that are stationed here, that are active duty, that are part of their mentorship and training. So they get a lot of exposure that the OCS and many of the ROTC guys do not. But, you know, it's just the nature as to how it's designed. Um, most guys training for BUDS right now know to be prepared and solid at running, swimming, lifting cows. What do you think most people don't know? they should include in their training plans for buds you know great question i had this question asked the other day on a live q a and i always say treading people blow off treading water and while you're treading you can also practice some of the drown proofing skills that that's going to help you with your overall water confidence um and lunging I would say treading and lunging are really tough. Calisthenics, yeah, you know, you're going to be doing a lot of push-ups, you know, every day. Not that big a deal. Um, you're going to be doing, like, the first four weeks, that log PT, boats, hell week. You know, there's not a lot you can do to prepare for hell week. The only thing I can say that what best prepares you for hell week are the first three weeks before hell week. Because if you think about it, all Hell Week is, is basically three weeks of training crammed into one. So everything that you've learned in those first three weeks are going to be relearned or retested or tested in Hell Week. Um, logs, boats, running, rucking, bear crawling, wet and sandies. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. I would say where people screw up their training is they think treading is easy. Only way treading is easy if, is if you have like 20 pounds of fat on you, then it's floating, but then sinking is going to be hard. So everybody has a weakness, whether you're lean or whether you're not lean. Good question though. Um, Sorry for the wrong typing. Oh, no problem. I was just messing with you. What I meant was if it's worth sacrificing sleep for training or other activities. Um, sometimes, but not day after day after day. I mean, I think like this morning I woke up, didn't sleep that great. It's Monday morning, had a busy weekend. Um, I did not feel like working out, but, you know, six hours of sleep. Um, I went worked out anyway. Um, but that, you know, th those kind of moments are very powerful. You know, when you go train, even when you don't feel like training, that is a level of discipline that is required, you know, of these type of activities that you're thinking about doing as a profession one day. Um, so let it become a habit because you're not going to be motivated to train every day. Um, so I mean, sometimes that is good, but 
it's better to get some sleepy time also. But there's nothing wrong with working out even when you don't feel like it. Having some issues with my shoulder on push-up starts to feel strained and sore after high reps. Could it be a technique issue? Could be. I don't know. Send a video. We'll critique it. Um, could be just because you're doing too much. Maybe you're doing daily push-ups. I One reason I tell people not to do push-ups and pull-ups every single day you know, at high volumes is because of this. People hurt themselves. You know, some people will do calisthenics one day and then weights the next day, which is just a horrible combination as well, because you're doing upper body push and pull four or five days in a row if you do it that way, especially if you're doing upper body stuff. I would say legs are very important. You can't skip leg days. So if your shoulder's sore, just start pushing some leg days, you know, in there. Maybe do a pulling leg day like deadlifts one day and squats the next. You know, hit some Stairmaster with a weight vest, do some hills. You know, those are going to come in handy too one day. Um, senior in high school, leave for basic September 23. That's good. You got some time after uh, after graduating high school. Looking for workouts to do to be the best in my class and ready for special forces. Any other advice? You could be great. Yes. Um, I want you to read. It's kind of too late now. Uh, when you say special forces, Robbie, do you mean army special forces? Because that's who is army special forces. Uh, Air Force and Navy are called special warfare. Navy SEALs, Air Force PJs. Right. They're not actually called special forces. The army is called special forces. So when you use the term special forces, I think you're going army. Good news about army is there's some logical progressions throughout your beginning training that can prepare you for. Army special forces selection, um, Navy and Air Force do not have that in their pre-training. Their boot camps are basically deconditioning periods for anybody wanting to go special warfare. Uh, so they have these prep courses after that are pretty good. Six to eight weeks of prep course that get you back up to where you were, but you got to do a lot of your prep before you go to BUDS or to Air Force Special Warfare you know, selection, assessment and selections. So it depends. Depends on what branch of service you're looking for. But I have a ton of information. In fact, Robbie, why don't you do your research and read this? This is called Spec Ops Prep. This is a great article. Um, in fact, it's so great, I may even share it for you there, Robbie. Um, check this out. So let me just share this screen here, if it lets me. All right. So there's an article I call the one-stop shop for Spec Ops research. So if there is such thing as a Spec Ops Google, this is it. Okay. And I've written it two years ago. So it's been out there forever. And there's a lot of articles that link you to these. So there's podcast links. There's, you know, how to be a better recruit. You know, this is, you know, and then I ask you, are you this person? You know, Spec Ops candidates, read this article. Very important. Um, you know, I talk about the fitness standards, what standards are good enough. And I use that term good enough very loosely because it's not like you're shooting for the minimum standards. Like if you can do a nine minute mile and a half, great. That's good enough. Right. Do you want to run an 830? Sure, if you want. But nine's good enough. Right. 1030 is not good enough. Um, so there, there's some standards in there that show you. Like if you go through, you click that article, it'll show you in probably 20 different exercises and events that you should be able to do and what standards are set that are competitive scores. So my good enough definition is what is competitive? 
So there's a whole lot of stuff in here from strength, PST numbers, all those things. Um, there's also something too I call the set yourself a performance starting line, not an arbitrary timeline. So I look at you as September 23. That is kind of an arbitrary timeline because I don't really know what your performance is as of right now. Um, if you're just now starting your spec ops prep, you're probably behind the eight ball a little bit, right? But hopefully you've had some athletic experience where you come in with half of those events, you know, elements of fitness already crushing, and then you can, you know, work on your weaknesses the next eight to nine months, which is plenty of time to do that. So, you know, all of this stuff right here, crush the PST, PST clinics, pass test workouts, which now is called the IFT, um, you know, 50, 50 swim workouts. And then this one, this is seal, the official seal recruiting pages. If you don't know what these are, you need to look at these army special forces has one air force special warfare has one Marine Corps recon and MARSOC has one, you know, these are official military recruiting links that depending on what group you're going into, you better go here first. It's very important. You know, if you're neglecting that, you're just hoping the recruiter is telling you the truth. Then this is some classic articles here. So you want to be a frog man? Read this. It has even more tips in there. Um, one of my favorites, though, is um, the perfect storm for failure. And that one is for mostly teenagers because they... Uh, they tend to be the highest part of the attrition rate. So as you can see here, there's a whole lot of stuff in here from all the branches of service, um, whether it's buds or, or whatever um, that you need to do. So once again, Special Forces is Army. Let me see if you answered my question. Air Force CCT. So you are now Special Warfare, not Special Forces. Just the difference when you tell people they won't know what you're talking about. Um, so, yeah, check out the Air Force section I just showed you. It's very important. And I've already talked to you a little bit about, in fact, the IFT difference between, this is a good one too, for you guys that are considering either or or, the differences between the PST and the IFT. That's a good article as well. Explains a lot of the, you know, the nuances of taking the test, being better at the test. A lot of this is, um, you know, practice. The more you practice that IFT, the better you're going to do. Um, uh, in fact, I even did a uh, pass test clinic. We, we used to call it the pass test. Now it's the IFT, so still a habit. Uh, check out this article. It's the uh, IFT clinic. It's really good. It breaks down the process of that whole test. You need to master that test if you haven't done it yet. Then you need to start working on your water confidence. You're running longer, you're rucking, build some strength up so you can handle some logs and boats because you do have logs and boats there as well. All right, next question. In fact, this may be one of my last ones. We are jamming here. It's almost 10 o'clock. Um, I have selection in April, and now to then, I want to drop 15 pounds. Not hard. Just work out hard. Um, should I be focused on cardio endurance, or should I be straight cow, oh, street cow split, strength cali split while cutting? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I personally tend to lean out more when I do calisthenics and cardio. Uh, primarily though you can still lose weight with lifting but it needs you know i do not i'm one of those guys when i look at weights i gain weight right if i look at food i gain weight right so um you have to watch your food intake as well as your uh calisthenics and cardio caloric burn um which you can burn a lot of calories that way and getting great, I mean, if your goal is to get better at endurance, my recommendation is to do more endurance and cardio. So I would 
cows run bike swim ruck you know all of those things are going to be a really good way to do it um and just burn some calories and then eat fewer so let's see looks like oh yeah vortex a lot of rucking man so yeah that vortex no joke you're going to be running and rucking your ass off so i would definitely recommend that you know spend most of your cardio time running and rucking and um most of your um resistance training you know depending on your athletic history um if you've spent a good amount of history in strength world i wouldn't worry about adding a lot of weights however if you're not very good with strength foundation you might want to mix in some lifting in there and i would suggest maybe the three to one block periodization model but this way it's backwards so this one right here this is a spring training three to one block periodization model where the focus is three weeks of calisthenics and cardio one week of lifting so it's a good way to maintain some of your strength needs that that you need to maintain especially if you just came out of a winter lift cycle and you you know you're a hard gainer and you put on 10 pounds of mass you know this is a good way to not burn it all off because all you're doing is um you know a lot of calisthenics and cardio so there you go. Hope that helps. Yeah, that this will give you some water training too, as well. Yeah, this is really good. So, Robbie, coming from a football wrestling background, great. Those are two great sports that prepare you well. You have a strength foundation. You have a calisthenics running and... Um, just toughness foundation. Both of those sports are great for that. So, you know, I, I would still read this article and just be aware of it because, you know, the young 18 year old mind in a new state, new city, you know, your girlfriend breaks up with you while you're living in the barracks. It's just, it, it messes with you. Right. Um, so check out this article. It's called The Perfect Storm for Failure, and it's really designed for 18-year-old brains. I won't lie to you. Because um, a lot of these people, when they're away from home for the first time, they're battling homesick, missing all their friends. They've got a whole bunch of new people they're living with. People are yelling at them. They're asked to be in perform to perform at their highest levels of physical possibility that they didn't even think was possible. Um, all at the same week, and it, it it it's usually not a good ending for the teenage uh, spec ops candidate. And I'm just talking statistics, right? Yeah, it's spec ops training is hard for everybody, but it seems to be. Yeah, I agree, Tom. It seems to be really hard for the teenage mind. I would agree. These are great questions. I'm. In fact, I'm going past the hour just because I'm looking at these other questions and I don't want to miss them because they're really good. Another one, I leave for basic in December this year. Going to be the HM. Want to join FMF. Great stuff before I try out for ATF, which is kind of like the uh, Sark Corman, uh, Special Ops Recon Corman. Um, any tips on this specific pipeline? Yes. Go with the Marine Corps training programs. You need to be doing pull-ups, planks. I guess you can do crunches still maybe, or they take them out all together. So pull-ups, planks, three-mile timed runs are no joke. You know, you still got to do the mile and a half, uh, but get good at that three-mile timed run stuff. Uh, if you can find a Marine Corps obstacle course, that's important. Um, if you can find it, you know, the, that – be able to do what's called the college boy roll, get over to the pull-up bar. Um, you can Google that. Uh, I have a video on my YouTube called the college boy roll uh, movement. Basically, just flip over a bar, 
versus doing a muscle up. Um, but yeah, you got to work on your pull-ups, got to work on your three mile timed runs and rucking, you know, you're going to be doing all that stuff. And then of course, eventually, whenever you go into the Sark side, you're going to have to be adding swimming to that as well, because there's a dive component that you're going to have to prepare for. So at first I would just stay, keep it all on land, increase your running, add pull-ups. That's your primary function right now compared to navy pst type stuff pft stuff but yeah check that out on, on my Stu smith fitness you can see i got a whole section there for uh, marine workouts and i would say let me see if i can find it real quick for you um this is a really good one <clears throat> yeah check out this uh link right here this is the Marine Corps IF, IST and PFT workout. <clears throat> All right. I'm not here every morning. I am here Monday and Tuesday mornings, 9 a.m. And then you can send me emails, however, Stu at Stu Smith. In fact, let's uh, start closing this up a little bit. In fact, if I missed your question, you can send me an email. StuartStuSmith.com. You can see it right here. That's how I spell my name down here at the bottom. Um, StuartStuSmith.com. Send me an email. I will get to it personally. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be doing the uh, swimming uh, uh, focus and um, focusing on the CSS. But if you send me a freestyle, you want to see yourself critiqued with freestyle, happy to do it. Um, don't forget, I uh, have a TikTok page, uh, Stu Smith 50 It's the same address as my Instagram page. Both of those have a ton of my latest combat swimmer stroke critiques on them. So you can go to TikTok. You can go to my reels over at Instagram. Also, if you're here on YouTube, got 100 CSS videos here from a decade ago. A little bit older, but still the same. Um, but I would say I probably have become a better coach in the last 10 years than I was. Um, that's just from experience, as with anything. So I think that's it. I think I got everybody's questions. If, once again, I missed it, just send me an email, stuartstusmith.com. Happy to answer it. Uh, if you guys go to... Um, stewsmithfitness.com you will see more articles um got a bunch of podcasts over there um books ebooks as well over 40 different books and ebooks sold over there all tactical fitness related pretty much got a couple beginners out there too um all right so i guess that's it guys thanks for listening this long i appreciate it i'll be back tomorrow morning uh, where we'll do some video breakdowns of some CSS swimming. So until then, you guys have a good one. Happy Halloween. Have fun.